Last class, uh, we left off with the, uh, the Hittite uh, Empire and we talked about the uh, uh, monumental architecture of the uh, Hittites. We uh, talked about the uh, close connection of Hittite architecture with uh, nature and how, uh, whether it be religious architecture, whether it be uh, military architecture, the uh, design of the monumental buildings of the uh, Hittites uh, usually takes place with uh, great sensitivity to uh, nature, in marriage with uh, nature, enhancing natural uh, properties. And the reason for this, we said, is uh, perhaps due to uh, the uh, close connection of uh, natural deities. In the Hittite religion, the uh, mountains, the uh, peaks, the valleys, uh, water sources, uh, water cults are very, very important. And the Hittite uh, gods and goddesses are um, anthropomorphic representations, uh, deified representations of the heavens, the sky, mountains, and so on. So to see this mode reflected also in motivations that uh, shape architectural design is not at all uh, surprising. And this did not happen overnight. Before the Hittites were uh, several uh, diverse indigenous uh, uh, peoples uh, living in Anatolia. And what the Hittites did was to uh, bring them together under a centralized uh, rule, which is why uh, sometimes uh, in a colloquial way, we refer to the Hittites as the people having a thousand uh, gods. And uh, one of these uh, was the uh, Hatti civilization. And we started our class by looking at some uh, objects that came from the funerary context of the uh, Hatti uh, civilization. And uh, looking uh, at these, we said that uh, there are uh, meanings which uh, are carried even to our uh, day. And the monumentalized version of this uh, representation of the uh, heavens being uh, carried upon the uh, horns of a uh, bull, showing uh, the uh, stag and some other natural uh, animals, gives us a sense of that uh, natural uh, pantheon. So uh, these beliefs of the uh, Hatti uh, were uh, continued in Hittite times uh, as well, and we find them uh, affecting the shaping of their uh, art, architecture, and the shaping of their religious objects. We saw a series of uh, standards like this one, uh, wooden uh, poles, which had uh, elaborate uh, endings uh, in the form of uh, stags, in the form of uh, white uh, animals, made of uh, precious uh, animals, uh, metals, uh, like uh, silver uh, combined with uh, bronze, giving us a rather uh, stylized, dilute uh, aesthetic, uh, a very <laughs> fine uh, shaping in artistic uh, uh, form. Uh, other uh, standards, uh, other uh, objects in uh, gold, like uh, diadems, uh, buckles, uh, golden uh, cups, golden uh, vessels, these were all uh, funerary uh, gifts coming from tombs at al that belonged to the Hatti civilization of the 3000 uh, BC. Since these were uh, gifts, they represent the best of uh, what the craftsmen at that time uh, could <coughs> produce, and they give us a splendid idea of what a high level of uh, metal craftsmanship had been attained at that uh, time, already in 3000 uh, BC. Uh, our knowledge, we said, about the uh, Hittites comes uh, not only uh, from the archaeological remains or the uh, architectural uh, remains or the uh, uh, vessels that we uh, found, which uh, are found uh, to a great number in the Anatolian Civilizations Museum, but also from cuneiform uh, tablets, like this one you see on the screen. Uh, these uh, cuneiform uh, tablets 
give us uh, information about uh, lists, about uh, treaties, and they have been deciphered. And uh, the uh, experts who can uh, read the uh, language on the uh, cuneiform uh, tablets have translated them, and uh, we have an access to uh, a word of mouth coming directly from the uh, Hittites uh, themselves. We don't have to interpret. This is the uh, direct evidence we have from the uh, Hittites. Uh, other objects we talked about, like uh, models of uh, towers, or again, uh, birds of various uh, kinds, give us a, a reflection of the uh, religious uh, rituals. And <coughs> most popular uh, among these were uh, the uh, bulls, uh, again, with the horns of consecration. And I pointed to a uh, uh, continuation of this uh, same uh, trend that we saw in uh, Çatalhöyük. You uh, probably remember quite well the horns of consecration from the uh, houses in uh, Çatalhöyük. And uh, 3,000 years uh, later, we have exactly uh, the same uh, idea uh, emerging in uh, the uh, use of objects in religious uh, practice. Uh, another one uh, here, uh, again, you see a ferocious uh, animal with the uh, mouth uh, opened and having a <laughs> spout for pouring in uh, water. So in various forms, we have uh, either on a small scale or a, a larger scale representation of uh, these uh, natural uh, deities which uh, shaped Hittite life. And uh, the most uh, uh, perhaps uh, outstanding uh, uh, artwork that is uh, frequently uh, shown when you talk about uh, Hittite uh, art is this uh, uh, elegant uh, vase, which is a uh, bird spouted uh, jug having a very thin uh, base, a very uh, 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 widening uh, belly. Uh, with a uh, center in the uh, widest uh, part, but then uh, having the uh, spout of the uh, jug in the form of a bird's uh, beak. And the whole uh, arrangement, having one bold sweep of a line uh, connecting the uh, handle and the uh, mouth of the uh, jar, and then the composition of the uh, curves, uh, attenuated toward the end and uh, terminating in a rather uh, narrow uh, base, uh, but still maintaining uh, balance, show us to uh, what extent the um, Hittite uh, artists could um, uh, express an uh, aesthetic <laughs> beauty in addition to the utility of the objects. But what I pointed out about this vase was also the fact that uh, the continuation of the expression of uh, nature as an inspiring source is even here, but it is in a rather stylized form. The inspiration is the bird, but it doesn't look like a bird. The bird here is the uh, inspiration which uh, shaped the uh, configuration and composition of this uh, vase. Uh, then uh, we looked at uh, a few uh, natural uh, sites uh, pointing at the open air worship of the uh, Hittites. And uh, here uh, we saw the uh, sheer uh, uh, rock cut uh, cliff amidst uh, forests, amidst uh, greenery, uh, amidst the uh, water, and uh, all under the open sky of the uh, heavens. And the same people who could produce the uh, refined uh, jars in the form of a uh, bird's you know, uh, mouth, a bird's uh, beak, were also the same artists who could carve uh, monumental uh, reliefs on the raw surface of the rock. So uh, they worked on uh, incredible, gigantic, monumental scales, but they could also uh, reduce the uh, scale to uh, utilize the same source of uh, uh, inspiration deriving from uh, nature. 
uh, these um, uh, natural uh, cult uh, spots find uh, their uh, most uh, organized uh, expression in Yazılıkaya, which is uh, not far from the capital of the uh, Hittites. It's about two kilometers. And we pointed at the uh, significance of the uh, rock, the uh, natural uh, rock-cut uh, cliffs, which were uh, carved with the monumental uh, reliefs of the uh, gods, uh, all open to the sky. The uh, ceiling uh, has not fallen off. It never existed. In its original state, it was uh, open to the sky. So uh, the gods of the heaven, uh, the gods of uh, nature, were all represented under the uh, open sky of the same uh, universe. And uh, the uh, uh, religious uh, uh, ceremonies that uh, took place also uh, took place under the uh, open. Uh, this uh, sanctuary here, this open air uh, sanctuary, uh, also shows us the um, uh, significance of uh, conveying to the people the um, harmony of the gods with the rulers of the uh, empire. <coughs> so the Hittite uh, king is also represented alongside the gods. So this would translate to mean that uh, the uh, gods favor uh, the kings, and if the gods and the kings are in uh, uh, agreement, if they uh, are in a harmonious relationship, this means that the uh, empire will prosper. They will be uh, water for the uh, crops. They will not be floods. They will not be uh, famines. In other words, they will be a kind of uh, balanced, uh, prosperous uh, life, uh, all under the aegis of the uh, gods, uh, through and also through the uh, king who is the representative and ruler of his uh, people. The uh, man-made uh, parts that we uh, saw are the annexes. They are not the uh, fundamental worshipping uh, area. Uh, we uh, pointed at the uh, ablution area uh, where uh, people gradually came in a uh, sequence of uh, spaces from the outside to the inside, gradually further inside. Then uh, they um, uh, purified themselves with the water, and only after then did they enter the uh, sacred uh, precincts. The uh, pantheon of gods is uh, quite well uh, known, uh, we said. We have the god of you know, uh, weather, the god of heavens, the sun uh, goddess, and they are all uh, represented in the uh, consort of uh, wild uh, animals and personified uh, mountains. I mean, one of these uh, mountains here is the uh, personification of the holy mountain of Cassius, which is uh, close to uh, Antakya at this uh, point. So these were uh, real places. They were uh, known, and uh, they find uh, their uh, place also in the iconography of the uh, reliefs. The gods are hierarchical. You have the more significant gods, then you have the uh, lesser uh, gods, and uh, all of these uh, gods are uh, necessary to uh, maintain the uh, prosperity and livelihood of the uh, Hittite uh, people. Uh, the view of Yazılıkaya that you probably would see uh, today uh, now, as you see this, uh, in this uh, the, the, uh, photograph of the uh, tourists, is uh, very much similar to uh, what the Hittites would have encountered. The same raw power of the rock, the same uh, nooks and uh, crannies, uh, untouched, uh, the feeling of nature is, is uh, there. So uh, you would uh, move uh, through that, feeling the power of uh, nature before you uh, proceeded to the uh, actual carved uh, areas. So here are the uh, remains of the uh, annex, which uh, survive in foundation uh, form. Uh, the uh, relief I just uh, showed you is uh, this one. Uh, in the late morning, you have uh, the best uh, view. 
the light uh, shines uh, on it, so you can make out the uh, figures. But if you look carefully at other parts, uh, all the uh, surrounding uh, parts at the same uh, level uh, are uh, carved with uh, a pantheon of gods, the reliefs of the uh, different uh, gods, whether they are gods of the underworld, whether they are junior gods, and some of the gods are not even uh, uh, identified. We don't know uh, their uh, identity. So here uh, they are, uh, and then there are platforms where uh, libations or offerings to the uh, gods could be uh, placed as a uh, thanking, a thanking uh, gesture to uh, them. Uh, whether these gods were uh, standing and uh, looking at the congregation, or whether they were in a uh, ceremonial uh, procession, is really not that relevant, whether it was that way or the uh, other way, is not so important, uh, except to uh, know that uh, the presence of the gods, as the religious ceremonies was uh, going on, uh, and the uh, symbiosis here, the merging of the uh, real ceremony and the uh, merging of the uh, represented uh, gods in one uh, space was the important thing. So while the ceremonies uh, took uh, place within the uh, sacred uh, precinct, uh, it was done in the uh, awareness that somehow the gods were touched upon. So the uh, reliefs uh, became a kind of mental bridge whereby uh, the uh, people who were, uh, uh, the priests who were worshipping in the sacred uh, ceremony uh, had an access uh, to, to the uh, gods. So they were very instrumental in this sense. They were not just uh, aesthetic uh, carvings to uh, look at for uh, pleasure. They had a religious uh, significance in that sense. So here's uh, another uh, array of uh, marching uh, gods uh, here in the major uh, sanctuary, and then uh, uh, a relief uh, showing the uh, uh, staff of the uh, king, uh, King Totalia, standing on top of the uh, mountains, just like the gods do. Uh, because when Totalia dies, he also becomes deified. He becomes uh, divine, so he is a lesser god, and he will become a lesser uh, god. And uh, we uh, know the uh, identity through the uh, cartouches, which were uh, uh, special hieroglyphics combined with uh, uh, pictorial uh, signs that stood like the uh, token, the logo for uh, each uh, god. So the identities are quite well known through uh, those. And uh, this is a very important <laughs> scene because uh, it shows uh, the uh, god embracing the uh, king. And I draw your, your attention to the difference of scale between the uh, larger you know, god and the uh, smaller scale uh, king uh, here. And again, you have the uh, cartouches uh, revealing the uh, harmony uh, between the world of heavens and the uh, man-made world. Uh, the king is um, uh, embraced by the <laughs> god, so things are going uh, fine in every uh, sense. In a smaller sanctuary, uh, we uh, saw uh, an eclectic representation, which uh, perhaps um, points to the uh, syncretization of the uh, different gods from the different uh, peoples, which all became eclectically <laughs> combined in the form of a uh, sword, but we don't know exactly which identity is represented here. Most probably, we have a multiplicity of uh, identities showing the uh, merging of the different <laughs> gods. Uh, the small uh, chamber uh, here, um, uh, which uh, has a small uh, base, Maybe there was a freestanding uh, statue there, we do not know. But what has survived in the uh, Yazlikaya uh, chambers, the two chambers constituting uh, Yazlikaya, uh, uh, have uh, revealed uh, no freestanding uh, statues.
They are simply uh, reliefs arranged around the uh, walls. Similar to uh, Yasulikaya, we also had a brief look at Eflatunpunar, which uh, represents uh, a sacred area uh, around a source of uh, water, where the water still uh, stands. And similar to um, uh, Yazlikaya, where you had uh, the pantheon of gods, uh, here you also have a series of gods connected with uh, nature. They are all uh, honored at the point where uh, the uh, water cult turns into a ceremonial uh, space. And it still survives uh, today, being uh, protected by the uh, lions, uh, uh, which um, uh, protect the uh, city gates of uh, Hattusha uh, as well. And at this point, we uh, started talking about Hattusha itself, the capital of the uh, Hittites. And uh, we uh, 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 concentrated uh, a little bit on the uh, topography at that uh, time. We um, uh, pointed to the uh, rugged uh, topography, the rolling uh, land, where the flora and the fauna were uh, quite uh, you know, different, where uh, tigers, where uh, leopards, and perhaps uh, lions uh, were freely uh, roaming at that time. So uh, the uh, sources of water, the uh, forested area, the alternation of uh, valleys with uh, hills made um, the whole uh, topography uh, very, um, uh, I mean, a part of uh, nature that was constantly uh, felt. You were always aware of it. You raised your head, I mean, you saw the uh, mountains, you looked down, you saw the you know, uh, running uh, water deep in the depths of the uh, valleys. So nature was very lively, it was very kinetic and alive at that time. So it's not surprising to see that there's such a sensitivity and awareness of nature also in the man-made you know, production, the man-made uh, design. So uh, creatures uh, like uh, <laughs> these, which I, sh I showed, uh, existed, um, uh, especially this Anatolian uh, tiger, existed in the uh, 50s. But because of uh, uncontrolled uh, hunting uh, by people like uh, Manto uh, Hassan, uh, uh, paved the way for uh, making them uh, an endangered uh, species. Uh, some species are extinct, and some of them are uh, close to extinction. But we can uh, safely uh, imagine that in Hittite times, you saw many more of these uh, creatures uh, <laughs> roaming in the uh, fields and in the uh, mountains. So uh, today, uh, we still uh, have the uh, rock, we still have the uh, hills, we still have the uh, sources of uh, water where Boazköy uh, is. Uh, the uh, water still runs uh, through the uh, valleys. And uh, when we look at the tops of the uh, mountains, if we look uh, carefully, we shall see that the uh, man-built uh, environment seems to uh, grow out of uh, nature. The rock uh, rises in the form of uh, cliffs. And if you look very carefully, you will see that on tops of uh, many of the uh, hills, were um, uh, remains of the uh, Hittite architecture, uh, palaces, uh, temples, or uh, fortification uh, walls on a monumental uh, scale. It's especially apparent uh, here. You see the uh, cliffs, and then uh, you see the uh, foundations of uh, monumental Hittite architecture, the uh, parts of the fortifications of the uh, Hattusha, uh, the city, uh, continuing uh, on the spurs of the uh, mountain. The uh, map of the uh, city, the plan of the uh, city, uh, shows the uh, contours quite uh, well. And uh, with the uh, contours, you can see that the uh, uh, use of uh, uh, man-made uh, features in steep areas 
and then in the more gently slowing, sloping uh, areas is not identical. Uh, where uh, uh, nature was uh, sufficient, there was no need for uh, strengthening nature uh, further. Uh, advantage was taken of nature and nature provided the natural walls for uh, defense. But in the southern part of Hattusha, where you had uh, the uh, fortification uh, walls uh, here, it was necessary to uh, strengthen the um, uh, access to the uh, city and also uh, to uh, make the uh, city um, uh, the acquire a strong image. So it wasn't just the real defense of the city, but was also the uh, image of the uh, defense, which was as important as the physical features of the defense itself. So people uh, seeing the uh, uh, very impressive you know, fortifications built by the uh, Hittites would think twice about uh, trying to uh, attack the city. Just the appearance of the city was enough to uh, keep off the, the uh, enemy. And uh, in addition to that visual uh, impact, uh, the uh, several uh, gates, like the uh, Lion Gate or the uh, King's Gate or the Sphinx uh, Gate uh, here, were uh, further uh, strengthened with uh, monolithic blocks of uh, stone, which were carved with uh, uh, the king uh, reliefs or with the reliefs of a uh, lion or the uh, sphinx, which added in an apotropaic manner. Apotropaic means warding of evil, keeping the evil uh, away by frightening uh, the uh, evil that uh, might you know, uh, provide some kind of uh, danger. So a view of the uh, southern part of Hattusha from the uh, outside, we are looking at the defenses from the outside. The city is beyond the uh, wall. Uh, the uh, glimpse will uh, reveal uh, to us this uh, white sloping uh, portion, which is the glacis, G-L-A-C-I-S, uh, -A glacis. And this is a, a sloping uh, area built of a uh, fist size uh, stones, white uh, stones, um, uh, above which rise the uh, stone uh, portions of the uh, wall, which would additionally uh, have had a mud brick portion. A very impressive wall uh, indeed, even uh, today. And then through the uh, wall uh, itself was a, a tunnel built of uh, stone, built of uh, blocks of uh, stone uh, in a corbel uh, fashion that we shall see in a short uh, while. And uh, in this uh, the, the, the slide, uh, you can see how the uh, man-built glacis with its uh, shining uh, uh, corners, its uh, impressive shining uh, appearance grows out of the native rock. It's as if there is uh, uh, no uh, difference between uh, the uh, natural and the man-made. The uh, man-made harmoniously continues the dialogue of nature. It continues the uh, organic uh, growth of the uh, natural uh, rock towards the uh, peaks. There is this uh, marriage of the uh, man-made and the uh, natural which is something you should always keep in mind when you are thinking of Hittite uh, architecture. The um, monumental um, skill of the uh, masons, of uh, the uh, Hittites, is even uh, more impressive when we think that these were the same people who could produce the uh, elegant bird-spouted uh, jars. And uh, here, as, uh, the, at the entrance, of the uh, uh, lion uh, gate, you can see the use of uh, cyclopean uh, masonry. CYC 
L O P E A N. Uh, the, the cyclopean simply means uh, gigantic uh, masonry. It comes from uh, a uh, mythological uh, character. Uh, it is a cyclopean, uh, in other words, it's a gigantic uh, masonry because of the size of each blocks. And here you see the human uh, figure. But what made this uh, very uh, strong was that uh, the uh, polygonal uh, shape of the uh, blocks, they were not always uh, rectangular, but the uh, polygonal uh, shape fitted together like a, a jigsaw uh, puzzle and it fell into a place with the, uh, uh, the weight of uh, gravity. Their sheer weight locked them into a place. So it would be impossible to shift these uh, blocks because they were simply so uh, heavy. And there was no binding material in between. No cement, uh, no uh, the mortar or anything of that sort. Uh, perhaps at the uh, placement stage of the uh, blocks, there was some uh, red mud to provide a slippery uh, surface uh, in which the blocks could be shifted into uh, place. But the blocks uh, stood there with the sheer weight uh, of uh, gravity, their own weight. That was a secret of this very strong uh, construction. So uh, it would be uh, impossible to uh, bore uh, a hole through uh, this uh, gate or to uh, dislodge it in order to uh, gain access to the inside. So uh, the, um, the image of the uh, king or the image of the um, uh, lion, or the image of the uh, uh, sphinx, uh, would provide the apotropaic dimension, the uh, mental uh, dimension, nazar uh, gibe. So it would uh, protect the uh, gates by uh, instilling uh, fear to uh, any uh, enemy that dared uh, approach uh, very uh, close. And then the sheer strength of the cyclopean masonry consolidated further with these hairpin arches. These are um, uh, the monolithic um, uh, upright vertical uh, slabs that uh, slanted slightly uh, upwards and then by uh, touching uh, each other, they locked together with the force of uh, gravity, similar to the cyclopean uh, masonry. Weight is very, very important here. Locking the stones, the blocks of stone, with the um, uh, uh, sheer uh, weight of them. So here you see uh, the uh, Sphinx uh, gate uh, together with the uh, figures and then the uh, hairpin uh, arches, the top of which uh, doesn't uh, survive uh, any uh, more. A closer view of one of the uh, creatures uh, you see the uh, fine, you know, uh, scales uh, here. I mean, they were uh, uh, depicted quite uh, carefully, uh, the showing the uh, details of the uh, animals, but they were supposed to uh, uh, d d d d dispel a certain amount of uh, fear. So the uh, knowledge of the uh, technique of carving stones the knowledge of the technique of putting them you know, uh, together was uh, combined with uh, military design. The uh, Hittite uh, architects and engineers were great military designers. So they built not only uh, strong fortifications, but they also built uh, intelligent ones. Uh, for example, uh, here, at, the, uh, at one of the uh, uh, top uh, parts of the uh, fortification, you see uh, a, um, a passageway, a, a paved uh, passageway, which would have allowed for uh, chariots to pass uh, through. So uh, the chariots uh, would uh, have um, uh, soldiers, uh, warriors, and uh, they would go from one tower to the uh, other, uh, uh, providing uh, further supplies, further, you know, armor, or simply uh, change the uh, warriors. So, uh, strategic uh, placement, 
uh, strengths and then uh, also tactical uh, design uh, which uh, took heed of the necessities of uh, defense, the necessities of you know, uh, attack, the necessities of you know, survival, anything that you would uh, need was also uh, taken uh, care of in the uh, architectural scenario which created a viable uh, design that made uh, all the processes of uh, defense and uh, attack very uh, uh, much more uh, better. In uh, two sides uh, of the uh, glacis, there were uh, stairs. So uh, in the event that it became uh, necessary, the uh, uh, Hittite warriors could come out into the uh, open and they could surprise the uh, enemy by uh, surrounding them and overpowering uh, them. So they were also uh, very uh, developed in terms of uh, techniques of uh, overpowering the uh, enemy in a military uh, tactical uh, sense. The uh, glacis is also uh, a very ingenious uh, device because uh, today when you uh, look at it, you say, ha ha ha, you know, uh, how easy it would be. Uh, you just have, uh, you know, a group of uh, men, a troop of men, and then uh, you sort of uh, start running on top of the uh, glacis, uh, which will make it possible to uh, uh, attain the uh, higher uh, parts. Well, it's not so easy. Once you throw slippery uh, materials like uh, boiling tar, uh, sujak katran, katran eri. Once you uh, throw all of that from the uh, top, uh, this becomes very, very uh, slippery, and then uh, you are uh, <laughs> overpowered even before you start your uh, attack. So there are uh, little uh, strategies uh, like that uh, as well. But above all, uh, it must be said that once the uh, top part was uh, also in place, you have to imagine it with the uh, top part, uh, you would have had something uh, both physically and uh, visually very uh, impressive. I mean, the physicality and the visuality of this uh, physicality uh, made a uh, mental impression on uh, people, which was as important as the uh, other you know, uh, durable uh, aspects of the uh, defense. Uh, the uh, techniques that uh, the Hittites uh, utilized to a great uh, extent uh, are perhaps very observable in the uh, tunnel uh, here, where the uh, corbelled masonry is uh, used. This is a terminology that you should uh, know. Uh, corbelled, C-O-R-B-E-L-L-E-D. Uh, the corbelled masonry here, again, is composed of a cyclopean uh, masonry. These are not rectangular, neatly cut masonry uh, blocks. They are roughly polygonal in shape. Uh, the tunnel is wider at the bottom, and then it becomes uh, narrower toward the uh, top, uh, by uh, gradually staggering each block of stone slightly inwards until they lock at the top, at the uh, center, with a uh, keystone. And it's very difficult to dislodge this because uh, the uh, blocks, just like the cyclopean <laughs> walls that we uh, saw a moment ago, fit into uh, each other and uh, lock the vault into uh, shape. Again, uh, no mortar is uh, used. So this uh, tunnel under the uh, uh, center of the uh, southernmost uh, part of the uh, defense uh, provided uh, a secret uh, passage which would be utilized when uh, necessary. Uh, within the fortifications, once we uh, enter, uh, we uh, see still the evidence for uh, many, many uh, temples. There were about 40 temples uh, inside, but only about, uh, uh, only uh, the foundations remain of those uh, temples. 
And then rising above the uh, temples, you see the natural uh, rock. So this view, again, would have been uh, very much uh, the uh, view the Hittites uh, saw. So when uh, the uh, defenses are uh, reconstructed in uh, modern projects like uh, <laughs> this one, uh, providing the uh, towers as the, uh, uh, the German architects have uh, done, uh, we might become a little bit dissuaded. I mean, this is very impressive, and it looks a little bit like the clay model I showed you at the outset of the class, with the crenellations, with the fenestration, uh, the projecting uh, towers, and then the connecting walls, which have the... Uh, uh, the pathways for the uh, chariots to uh, run over. Uh, they, they all show the military uh, strate strategy, but uh, uh, the, uh, the modern you know, uh, perception uh, may uh, become a little bit uh, disillusioned when uh, they consider uh, these uh, crenellations in relation to the uh, land. So you have to think that uh, the uh, impression that the Hittites uh, created uh, was um, uh, rather uh, different than our own. Because when I uh, used to look at uh, Hattusha many years ago, I used to be more impressed with the imaginative aspect of trying to imagine the walls uh, rising above the uh, rock. And when I see the uh, towers, at first glance, it looked like a Hollywood film set uh, to me, but you should not think of it in that uh, manner. So, uh, looking at the uh, temples inside, you see how many there were. These are the fortifications we just looked at. These are the, uh, the temples, the series of temples, and many of them. And then we have the major uh, palace, which is uh, a fortification within a fortification. And then we have the uh, major uh, temple to the uh, weather uh, god. And in all of this uh, architecture, one thing is absolutely outstanding. And that is the organic nature of the uh, design. There is uh, very little symmetry in Hittite architecture, except for the, uh, uh, the gate. Uh, parts, the uh, entrances. So the uh, remains of the temples that we see, like these uh, ones, uh, are not identical. You don't have uh, two temples which are uh, exactly similar. There's nothing which is absolutely similar, but as a uh, typology, they all share uh, common uh, characteristics which are uh, variations of the uh, great uh, temple, the biggest temple, to the uh, god of uh, heavens, to the weather uh, god. Uh, the characteristics are uh, a lack of symmetry. I mean, looking at this, uh, you see that uh, there is no uh, strict mirror symmetry at all, except for the uh, entrances. Here's an entrance, and here is another uh, entrance. But what we do have is a, a sequence of spaces, a, a progression of spatial episodes as you move from the outside to the inside. So you move from the outside to the inside to a uh, enclosed uh, the, 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 the courtyard where you can have your ablutions here. And that turns into a, a paved street then you have uh, another uh, entrance, and from that entrance, you get into an uh, enclosed uh, courtyard. And only after that do you have access to uh, where the uh, statue of the god was. And uh, another characteristic which needs to be stressed here is that uh, this uh, monumental uh, complex which had uh, magazines, which had uh, storage houses. Uh, several thousand cuneiform tablets were discovered here. So there were archives, obviously. Uh, there were storage depots. So it acted as uh, a, a complex uh, with um, 
multi you know, uh, functions of uh, archives, storage, in addition to the uh, religious uh, space which was inside. But despite this uh, conglomeration of uh, functions, despite the uh, tremendous building of uh, magazines, the actual chamber of uh, where the uh, gods you know, were was uh, open uh, with uh, windows. Uh, the uh, windows allowed the uh, flooding of light inside. So these were not uh, uh, dark, mysterious you know, spaces where the, the god would be uh, hidden from, from uh, gaze, but there was a, a connection with the uh, sky, with light, and with the nature uh, outside. And this is a significant characteristic, again, of uh, Hittite uh, architecture. So you have uh, enclosed the courtyards, and the courtyard is enclosed by uh, a variety of uh, facades. I mean, here you have a series of piers, here you have a blind wall, here you have a uh, gate, here you have another articulation. So it was uh, a great deal of uh, variety in the treatment of the walls that constituted the um, enclosed uh, courtyard. Uh, here I uh, show you uh, a few uh, reconstituted uh, pots to give you an idea of how the storage spaces uh, worked. Uh, these uh, pots would contain uh, liquids or they would contain you know, the grains. So it was a great you know, storage house uh, within the uh, temple. Uh, here you see how the uh, pieces are put uh, together. Some of the pots have ancient holes on them, indicating that they were repaired in ancient uh, times, not just our own uh, times. Uh, uh, the uh, palace of the uh, Hittites uh, uh, here, again, uh, is uh, rather uh, different in its uh, configuration from the great uh, temple that I just uh, showed you. But in terms of design principle, it is quite similar. So uh, the uh, palace shares common features with the uh, temples. Here too, the uh, idea uh, of uh, design is organized around a series of progressions. Uh, you move in from the uh, outside to the inside, you move in progressively uh, the, to uh, more uh, private uh, parts from one courtyard into uh, another. So there's a sequential uh, movement um, which uh, separates the uh, uh, more public from the uh, less uh, private uh, areas, uh, the more uh, secluded uh, areas. So uh, here too you uh, enter from the uh, fortifications uh, here. You uh, come into an open uh, area, going to a sacred pool if you uh, continue outside the palace, but within the fortifications of the palace. Or you go inside into uh, one courtyard. Uh, you have, uh, again, a, a gateway. Then you move into uh, the, uh, the second uh, courtyard, and then uh, at this uh, part, where we think were the uh, more private quarters of the uh, royal uh, family, there was a spectacular uh, view of the entire countryside, because this is one of the highest uh, parts of the uh, citadel. So again, they are close to the uh, heavens. Uh, they are situated in a very uh, airy uh, context, and they have uh, good visual uh, access to uh, the uh, distant uh, view which is uh, unfolding uh, in front uh, of them. So the uh, ideas of uh, organizing the uh, spaces in terms of the uh, different uh, courtyards which interconnect the uh, different uh, spaces in a uh, sequential uh, manner uh, are very simple, similar, whether it be the uh, temple or whether it be the uh, palace. And the uh, palace too, uh, here, uh, seems to uh, grow out of the uh, natural uh, terrain. Uh, 
uh, today when you're driving around in a bus or your private car, or if you're simply hiking along the citadel of Hattusha, you will uh, recognize the uh, casemates, which uh, seem to uh, take uh, advantage of the uh, bedrock, uh, and then uh, they build on top of the uh, bedrock. So, at this point, we will uh, now switch on to um, another uh, episode in the uh, Bronze Age, and this will be the episode of the uh, Egyptians. The Hittites were in uh, contact with the uh, Egyptians. Uh, they had um, several uh, uh, military encounters with them. Uh, there were uh, passages of people back and uh, forth. But Hittites uh, remained in the uh, Anatolian the peninsula, uh, and the um, uh, Egyptians uh, remained uh, along the uh, Nile uh, River, even though they occasionally ventured a little bit uh, north. Uh, nature was uh, very significant in uh, shaping Egyptian civilization uh, also, but in a very different uh, way. Uh, for the uh, Egyptians, life would not be without the river Nile. Uh, the Nile River running uh, from the uh, uh, Sudanese you know, mountains all the way to a uh, delta in the uh, Mediterranean for many, many uh, kilometers from mountainous land to uh, sea was the uh, life giver of the uh, Egyptians. So uh, the uh, flooding of the Nile every uh, year uh, with uh, waters, that you know, came from the uh, mountains, would make the uh, river overflow its banks. And when the river overflowed, it overflowed with a uh, rich deposit of uh, mud, which contained uh, uh, minerals. Minerals uh, very uh, necessary for uh, fertile uh, cultivation. And uh, when the uh, waters uh, receded uh, back, or when uh, they uh, evaporated to a certain extent, this uh, rich mineral uh, deposit became a natural fertilizer in order to grow uh, crops, crops. So the uh, uh, very uh, narrow strip of land along the uh, Nile uh, River um, was uh, where uh, the uh, uh, cities were built. Uh, it was where the uh, people uh, lived. So uh, the vegetation that uh, we see uh, around the uh, uh, Nile uh, River, the types of plants, the types of uh, trees, also find their way into the Egyptian uh, belief. But uh, other than these uh, motifs, perhaps uh, the uh, most uh, important aspect that we should point to in Egyptian uh, uh, culture and in, in Egyptian uh, belief is the uh, obsession with uh, afterlife and eternity. Uh, Egyptians were very conservative about uh, this. And uh, in their uh, uh, material uh, production, uh, in their... Uh, uh, sculpture, in their uh, architecture, uh, what we are struck about is uh, a sheer uh, monumentality, a sheer um, uh, conservatism, uh, a, a quest for maintaining what does not change. There are very uh, strict you know, rules. Things are done in a certain uh, manner. So when we look at the architecture, besides the uh, monumental uh, expression, we find uh, strict symmetries, perfect uh, corners, uh, mirror symmetries, rigid processional uh, axes, very different than uh, what we saw in uh, Hittite architecture a moment uh, ago. So uh, the, uh, the Hittite uh, the architecture, perhaps, because of this um, uh, natural trend on which they were uh, tremendously dependent upon, 
shows the uh, uh, obsession with uh, uh, what endures, what lasts uh, forever. So if uh, life depends on uh, uh, the river you know, flooding uh, annually, if the life depends on uh, the uh, sun you know, rising from the east, setting in the west, if the life depends on uh, the north-south you know, direction of the uh, river in a rhythmic uh, sequence annually, year after year, and if you cannot imagine any other kind of life, and if the life beyond the strip of the Nile uh, River is uh, difficult, if not uh, impossible, then perhaps it becomes uh, easier to uh, understand the preoccupation that the uh, Egyptians had with afterlife and with uh, death. Because if you believe in afterlife, then you believe in eternity. You believe in things repeating themselves. You believe in a, a life that will continue forever. And the uh, human life which you have for a short amount of you know, time, uh, once it uh, terminates itself, will not mean nothingness because uh, the life will you know, continue forever and ever. And for this, they uh, had in their uh, religion uh, a notion called the Ka, K-A. So uh, once the uh, physical life uh, ended, uh, the uh, life of the person would continue in the form of the Ka. The Ka would live forever and ever. So uh, uh, the um, uh, monumental statues that were built, the uh, architecture that was built, which was uh, especially in the earlier periods, a funerary uh, architecture, was done for the well-being of the Ka, because uh, the Ka would live on forever. You had a, a strong uh, tomb for preserving the Ka, for the uh, comfort of the uh, Ka, and then you decorated the uh, tomb with uh, scenes of uh, daily uh, life uh, so that uh, the Ka would, uh, you know, uh, have the continuation of this uh, life through these uh, depictions. And uh, when we look at uh, Egyptian um, culture from this uh, regard, it doesn't come at all surprising that uh, the uh, plant uh, motifs tend to monumentalize themselves. So uh, papyrus was uh, very uh, common, the lotus plant was very, very uh, common, and uh, as a result, we find that uh, the natural forms of lotus and the papyrus are monumentalized. They are turned into monumental columns, they are turned into uh, monumental uh, capitals, and they also live on forever and ever, inspiring the uh, major uh, motifs in um, uh, Egyptian uh, architecture. So when you uh, look at uh, gigantic uh, columns uh, like this ones, uh, you look at this uh, capital here, it doesn't look like any you know, uh, Hittite capital or a Roman or Greek uh, capital because it is a, a gigantic uh, blown up you know, uh, model of the uh, plants that they have, the lotus and the papyrus. So here you have the uh, lotus, and uh, here you have a monumental stalk. And I show the uh, human figures for you to, to um, impress in your mind to what extent uh, the, the uh, uh, blown up uh, scale uh, models could uh, materialize. Uh, uh, obelisks were uh, set up in um, uh, many parts of the uh, uh, kingdom in order to uh, carry on forever and ever the deeds of the uh, pharaohs who were the uh, rulers of uh, Egypt. So the uh, obelisks are uh, monumental uh, 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 shafts of uh, stone, usually of uh, granite or basalt, uh, both of which are uh, very uh, strong uh, stones, 
uh, difficult to um, uh, destroy. And uh, on this would be carved the hieroglyphics, uh, which would uh, design the uh, memory of uh, what the pharaohs wanted future generations to uh, remember. So you set up these uh, obelisks uh, that would uh, remind of uh, events and uh, significant uh, episodes that the pharaohs wanted future generations to uh, remember. So on the one hand, you have the uh, monumentalization of uh, natural uh, features, but on the other hand, you have the, um, uh, the conversion into uh, eternity of whatever happened on obelisks, on uh, columns, and uh, you uh, name it. So the idea of uh, memory, the idea <laughs> of uh, afterlife, uh, the idea of uh, life continuing after uh, death were very uh, significant uh, motifs that uh, shape Egyptian uh, architecture. So uh, here uh, you see the different types of uh, uh, the, the capitals. Uh, the, the three uh, capitals are here that you see, uh, these, uh, but also uh, these uh, capitals are here, are all inspired by Egyptian uh, plants. But they have been blown out of all uh, proportion and uh, they have been uh, monumentalized in order to make them uh, durable with uh, stone. So uh, stone is utilized uh, a lot because it's uh, durable. Uh, wood would not last a very long uh, time. So uh, the stone uh, and the box of uh, stone will uh, last forever and uh, ever. Uh, here's a Nile River rising from the uh, mountains in the uh, south, coming all the way to the uh, Mediterranean, a very uh, thin strip of land. And looking at Egyptian uh, cities, uh, the uh, major ones, here you have uh, Giza, you have Saqqara, which we shall you know, talk about, uh, you have uh, Karnak and uh, Luxor and uh, Deir el uh, Bahri. There is no city uh, here, there is no city here. They are all fitted into that uh, narrow tract of uh, land along the Nile uh, River. And then uh, beyond to the uh, west, you have the uh, Sahara uh, Desert, uh, that is where uh, life uh, cannot you know, survive very, very uh, easily. And then to the uh, east, you have the uh, Red Sea, and you have the uh, mountains. And in order to uh, locate yourself, you might be interested to know Mecca is there, uh, Medina is uh, there. But the uh, ancient uh, Egyptian uh, civilization was uh, all along this narrow tract of uh, land. And uh, unchanging uh, rhythms, eternal uh, rhythms, and these uh, eternal uh, natural and uh, astronomical uh, uh, rhythms shaped Egyptian uh, life in a rather inflexible way. So uh, the rules of uh, nature uh, dictated the rules in Egyptian life, and these rules in Egyptian life were in turn reflected to the uh, art and uh, architecture of the uh, Egyptians. And when did it all begin? Uh, we should say uh, around uh, 3000 uh, BC, in the early Bronze Age. So they are contemporaries with the uh, Alajahuyuk tombs. Uh, life existed, uh, we know, from archaeological evidence long before that. But 3000 BC is important because that was uh, the uh, time when Upper and Lower Egypt became united. And when Upper and Lower Egypt became uh, united, the uh, first uh, dynasty of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Egyptians came into uh, being. Uh, the first uh, dynasty of the uh, pharaohs. And then uh, from uh, the uh, unification all the way uh, to the uh, end, uh, the uh, pharaohs were known as the numbers of their uh, dynasties. 
In this uh, stele uh, here, a very uh, famous uh, one, we have the representation of the uh, unification of Upper and Lower uh, Egypt. Uh, the uh, symbolic uh, intertwining <laughs> of uh, Upper and Lower uh, Egypt shows that uh, Egypt became uh, one, to be ruled by the uh, pharaohs. And this became uh, possible by the uh, vanquishing of all the uh, enemies uh, with the you know, uh, pharaohs. Uh, the uh, enemies uh, all uh, were uh, ironed uh, out to make the beginning of the uh, dynasties uh, possible. And from then on, uh, we uh, can talk about a, a united uh, Egypt. Now, when we look at the uh, first uh, evidences of you know, uh, architecture, what we have uh, are not uh, durable uh, palaces, uh, durable you know, fortifications, but uh, tombs, which is not uh, surprising. Uh, because, as I said at the outset, the Ka was very important. Uh, uh, Ka uh, perpetuated uh, life after physical uh, death. So uh, tombs had to be built for the uh, deceased in order for the uh, Ka to uh, survive in afterlife. And uh, the uh, tombs of the uh, pharaohs, uh, which you all uh, very well know, the uh, pyramids, uh, did not come into being all of a sudden. It took uh, a great deal of trial and error from uh, smaller pyramids, from uh, structures which uh, uh, shaped the uh, pyramids, gradually uh, leading to the huge uh, pyramids that we have in uh, Giza. The earliest uh, tombs that uh, we have are uh, what we call the mastabas, M-A-S, T-A-B-A. Uh, these are uh, uh, tombs, a series of uh, tombs for uh, the uh, elite in Egyptian uh, society. Uh, they have battered walls. The walls are not so straight. They slightly uh, incline uh, upwards. And then they have uh, shafts which go underground, as you, know, you see uh, here, the shafts going uh, underground. Uh, leading to the uh, tomb uh, chambers. And the uh, chambers of the uh, tombs were uh, painted with uh, a series of uh, uh, the hieroglyphics or episodes from the uh, daily uh, life for the Ka. Uh, and in this uh, regard, if you look at the shape of the uh, mastaba, uh, you can uh, talk about the seed of the pyramid, uh, because later on uh, we uh, will see a transitional uh, stage where uh, mastabas you know, piled on top of each other will form a uh, stepped pyramid, and then from the stepped pyramid you will have the uh, major you know, pyramid as we uh, uh, commonly uh, know it. So inside the uh, mastaba, uh, in uh, the tomb of Senebjem, you don't need to remember the name you know, uh, at all, uh, you see uh, a series of uh, paintings uh, all over in the form of uh, registers. And these uh, paintings give us all aspects very graphically about uh, what uh, the uh, person would have done during his life on his estate. Uh, he uh, would have uh, engaged in, uh, in the uh, fields with uh, people, uh, workers in the uh, fields, uh, engaged in the harvests, males and the females. You see them in uh, graphic uh, detail uh, here. Uh, you would have seen them uh, tilling the uh, soil. Uh, so uh, for the uh, car, all these uh, lives during the uh, normal uh, life are presented in the walls of the uh, mastaba. Or uh, you would have uh, uh, engaged in um, ritualistic ceremonies. Here is a sacrificial scene with the tied uh, feet of the uh, animal, libations being uh, poured, and you even have the uh, butcher 
you know, uh, engaged in uh, dislodging the uh, uh, leg of, of the tied up uh, animal. So rituals were, were obviously important. You have boats on the uh, Nile uh, River in a funerary procession. Uh, you see the uh, uh, mourning uh, uh, ladies uh, there associated with the funerary ceremony. But not just funerary ceremonies, uh, also uh, the life in the Nile is often uh, depicted with great exactitude. So uh, you have the uh, birds of the Nile, <laughs> you even have a crocodile, you even have uh, fishes uh, here. And uh, if you look at these uh, fishes, I am sure you can identify them as specific types of uh, fish. They are not uh, imaginary. Uh, I mean, this is not uh, a barbon, I don't say, I, I wouldn't say, but uh, it would be uh, a local kind of uh, fish. So all these uh, vignettes of uh, everyday uh, life were painted over along the uh, walls of the uh, mastaba. In addition to the uh, uh, paintings on the uh, walls, uh, you also had small uh, figurines uh, showing the uh, slaves engaged in tasks that would take place on the estate of uh, the uh, deceased. Uh, here you have a, a slave, a woman, opening up, you know, uh, bread. She is kneading a you know, kind of uh, dough. Uh, and in this, you know, uh, figure, again, you have a, a slave engaged in uh, uh, you know, pounding uh, grapes for making uh, wines. Now, uh, these are uh, slaves, and the uh, paintings on the walls of the mastabas are also those of uh, slaves. So uh, there's no uh, rigid uh, uh, rules in depicting them. They are depicted in great uh, naturalistic uh, uh, aspect in great natural uh, compositions. But when it came to uh, depicting the elite or the uh, rulers, uh, these uh, depictions were very far from being natural. They were always depicted according to specific uh, rules called uh, canons. This is a very uh, canonical uh, art. C-A-N-O-N, uh, canon. A canon means a uh, rule, a uh, regulation, or a set of rules. So the uh, Egyptian uh, official uh, art is very canonical, like the uh, architecture, which is highly uh, regulated. So uh, with this uh, canonical uh, art, you have the uh, depiction of a scribe here, a scribe is the official uh, writer. This was an official uh, position, katip. Uh, and uh, you see that uh, the pose does not uh, change. He is always uh, depicted in um, a profile view. The face is shown from the side, from the uh, profile. And then uh, the um, uh, middle part of the uh, body is shown uh, frontally, and then the legs are shown in profile. This is an impossible position. So if I stand like this, and you see my face is sideways, and then I put my legs like this, one leg forward, that's okay. I mean, you see the face in profile, you see my legs in profile, but while I'm doing that, I can't, I can't turn enough to show you my uh, body, my uh, the torso, uh, frontally. So this is an artistic convention uh, which the uh, canon dictated, which was necessary according to the uh, canon, showing the torso uh, frontally, showing the face and the uh, legs, one leg forward uh, in a, a profile uh, view. And then uh, everything was dictated according to the uh, rule. You had uh, so many units for the height of the uh, leg or the arm. You had uh, so many units for the uh, torso, and then so many units for the uh, face. This is not a naturalistic depiction. Uh, they are not at all interested in conveying what the person looked like. 
but they are very interested in uh, representing uh, the uh, person uh, in the way they wanted to represent them. It's the image that is important, and the image is a very canonical one. So uh, in the, um, the hundreds of depictions that you see of the uh, official you know, uh, figures, uh, you won't be able to see a crooked nose or uh, the, an eye which is not in place, or a fat person or a thin person. This is not important. The idea is to represent according to the uh, canon. So there's a certain uh, idealization which fits the uh, rules that were the uh, accepted uh, rules. And uh, similarly in scenes as well. I mean, if you uh, depicted an you know, uh, event, in an uh, official you know, uh, manner, you uh, depicted these according to the uh, canon. So in the uh, freestanding statue, a very typical Egyptian uh, statue uh, here, not a drawing, but a freestanding uh, statue, the pose doesn't change. He is standing, the arms are down, one leg is slightly you know, forward, he is gazing somewhere, but nowhere in particular. It's an idealized, canonicized uh, position. Uh, and again, just like in the uh, drawings, uh, the, the uh, dimensioning, uh, the uh, proportioning of the uh, figure would have been done according to the uh, canons. So the Egyptian artist was not interested at all in uh, what we call creative art, creating something different, creating something uh, unusual. That was hardly his concern. He was not concerned about that at all. But he wanted to uh, present the best possible image which was uh, possible in the uh, canon. So the canon would be improved, but you would not try to go beyond the canon. The uh, canon was the uh, regulator. And this did not change whether you had uh, you know, three figures. I mean, uh, here <laughs> again, you see the canonical you know, position with the legs you know, slightly uh, forward and the uh, canon uh, applied to uh, the uh, pharaoh and his you know, uh, wife. They all had the canonical uh, proportions, the uh, canonical you know, positions. If the figure was uh, seated, again, there was a uh, canon for the seated figure. I mean, you had so many units for the you know, uh, part until the uh, knees, so many canons, uh, units for the uh, uh, torso or the uh, head, it didn't matter whether the person was uh, seated or uh, standing. Uh, in this uh, Lady uh, Senyui uh, figure, uh, one of my favorite uh, figures, again, uh, while uh, it looks very pleasing aesthetically uh, to us, it is highly canonical. It doesn't go uh, beyond the uh, restrictions of the uh, accepted canon of Egyptian uh, art. But uh, again, uh, with the uh, canon for the you know, uh, nose and the uh, eyes, she has a kind of a frozen uh, smile. They're not trying to show a sweetness of uh, space or uh, beauty or anything of that sort, but they're showing an uh, ideal representation, a cool kind of uh, beauty, which we shall see again in uh, uh, Greek art many centuries uh, later. So this uh, canonical uh, mentality that we observe in official art uh, drawings or uh, uh, statues, freestanding uh, statues, is the same mentality which dictated the uh, architecture. So uh, for the uh, pharaohs, uh, the final resting place was the uh, pyramid, uh, which you all you know, know about. But uh, the uh, placement of the uh, pyramid was easy enough. Uh, I mean, the 90 degree uh, angles, uh, the uh, cardinal points, north, south, east, west. So you had the four corners, no problem about that. But the problem was when you uh, tried to, came, when you tried to uh, raise the uh, pyramid, which would be the uh, right angle. 
I mean, if you uh, had a very narrow angle, then you would get uh, a flat pyramid. If you had a very high you know, uh, angle, then the pyramid would be unduly uh, tall. That would bring uh, problems. Sometimes you uh, started with one angle, and then <laughs> it changed into another. Economical mentality, trying to attain that. So maybe uh, looking at the one of the uh, first uh, you know, uh, pyramids, uh, uh, the, uh, the stepped uh, pyramid uh, of you know Zoser in uh, Saqqara. This is not very legible, so I will write it for you. Saqqara is a Q Q A R A. And the name of the pattern is uh, Zoser, sometimes spelled as Z-O-S-E-R, uh, but it doesn't really uh, matter. Uh, you will immediately remember the uh, master boss looking uh, at us. The uh, lesser noblemen had a master bar, and for their car, they uh, took up the walls of the you know, master bar with uh, scenes of daily life when they were uh, alive. They were also uh, figurines, like uh, the uh, slave figurines that we saw. But uh, Zoser is a pharaoh. He is on top of the social uh, ladder, uh, the top of the ruling hierarchy. So uh, his car would not be content with a mastaba. And since he was a ruler during his life, then his car would have to have a, a literary uh, city, a made up uh, city. So uh, the uh, tomb of you know, uh, Zoser has a step pyramid, which is not one mastaba, but uh, uh, like uh, the uh, uh, reminiscence of several mastabas stacked one on top of each other, but not even just a uh, monumentalized uh, uh, step uh, pyramid, but also uh, city walls. But this is a mock city, it's not a real city. It's a city for uh, funeral purposes for the uh, car. So uh, he has the uh, mock city, just like the lesser noble man had uh, paintings of fields. Then it's also has a miniature uh, sort of uh, uh, mock uh, city, complete with walls and then here's a pyramid, and then complete with a uh, hole, the uh, headset hole, where there will be a reenactment of his coronation ceremony. So yearly, uh, annually, there will be ceremonies that will commemorate him uh, in this uh, monumental you know, uh, complex, which is nothing but a funeral complex. And here are uh, a series of uh, chapels, which, um, uh, uh, which uh, uh, there are dummy chapels. None of those are uh, real temples. They are all dummy temples. And each one of them represents the uh, known and old empty, which is a, a region that he ruled over, Eyalet. So these are dummy chapels, and uh, just like the nobleman would have had fields to slaves, well, the pharaoh would have the city, uh, the uh, representation of the mount, uh, and then here's you know a pyramid, and then an area for uh, celebrating his uh, coronation after uh, death. Here you see a model of the uh, step pyramid, uh, and uh, through uh, this it became possible to conceive of a final uh, pyramid with the perfect uh, edges uh, later uh, on. It looks like this uh, today, still a monumental uh, mountain, massive uh, architectural uh, enterprise, even in its ruined form. The uh, dummy chapels, I mean, they seem to have an entrance. They have these uh, papyrus uh, columns, 
spiralized, monumentalized, papyrus to thought, but they are dummy channels. They are not real channels. They are representations of channels in three uh, dimensions. All for the car, because everything is done for the afterlife, for the uh, comfort of the uh, car. <coughs> here are the uh, uh, lotus you know, uh, capitals, monumentalized, taking the uh, plant of the uh, Nile and elevating it to uh, architectural uh, monumentality. And this led to the uh, uh, Giza uh, pyramids. Uh, in the Giza, we have the uh, three uh, very well-known uh, pyramids, the pyramids of uh, Chios, Kefren, and Mykenos. And uh, each one of these uh, is no longer stepped like that of Zoser. They have fine, you know, uh, edges, and they are complexes like those of uh, Zoser uh, because they have uh, uh, mortuary uh, chapels which are connected to them, and not being far from the Nile River each year, just like Zoser earlier, uh, their uh, coronations are celebrated after death. And uh, through the uh, uh, funerary uh, complexes, you uh, have the cars of the pharaohs live forever and ever. And this will be the uh, continuation uh, next week on uh, Monday. Thank you.